Okay, hi guys, welcome back to another session with Fresh Dental Shadowing. Today we have Dr. Wendy here and I'll let you take the floor. Thank you. Good evening. So good to see you guys. My name is Dr. Wendy Zhu. I graduated class of 2016 from the University of Detroit Mercy. Currently I reside and practice in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, full disclosure, I'm not a board certified pediatric dentist. I'm actually a general dentist that limits practice to seeing kids only 12 and under, which is actually a lot more common than I thought. So if you're interested in uh, seeing kids in your practice, we'll talk a little bit more about how I got to where I am. All right, so we'll briefly go over some of my academic journey uh, progress. So I'm pretty new to this virtual shadowing experience. Um, I've seen some example presentations and a lot of the presenters have, you know, a lot of great cases, a lot of good things to teach, but I'm going to go in a little bit more of a different direction for two reasons. Uh, one, seeing only children, you're not doing a lot of really cool cases. To be honest, a lot of it is just very basic things like cleanings and fillings. And I'm sure you already know what fillings look like. So we'll um, keep it minimal there. We'll briefly talk about that. And the other reason is uh, we do want to get to know a little bit more about the other important things of dentistry, such as um, things like how much it costs to go to school, how much you're going to be making, and as curious pre-dental students, I'm sure you're also maybe interested in seeing some of my grades, good and bad. Um, also, we'll talk about um, work-life balance and other stresses of our day-to-day -day in dentistry and how to live a stress-free life as best as possible. So I went to school in my hometown of London, Ontario. I completed my Bachelor of Science in Cell and Development and um, I don't know if you know this, but in Canada, a lot of the schools are research based. So I didn't have a really big plan, uh, no, just always assumed that because I went to a research based university that I was going to go into research. So I naturally progressed after my bachelor's to pursue a master's degree in science as well. Uh, some of my stats when I applied to dental school, very, very average, uh, nothing spectacular. I worked really hard to do decently on the DAT, but being Canadian, I knew I was pretty limited to where I was going to be able to apply. So I applied really early on and to mostly international expensive dental schools, um, which you, I'm sure you're aware of, where I interviewed and eventually was accepted to was at Boston University, University of Southern California, and University of Detroit Mercy, where I did end up attending in 2012. I lived in Detroit, which sounds awful, but I actually really enjoyed living in Detroit. It has a bad reputation, but I really like it. I recommend Detroit. I was guilty of reading a lot online of dental forums, what the good schools were. So I heard good things about the clinical experience in, De in Detroit. And honestly, it was just the cheapest and closest school. So that's where I ended up going. All right, so when they say that grades are forever, that holds true because this is a transcript from 15 years ago and I was able to access it today. So I can see that I did not do very well. I didn't have a goal or any direction to where I was going to go. I had no idea I was going to apply to a, dentist, a dentistry program. I even failed OrgoChem because, not because I was stupid, but I just didn't work very hard. I uh, didn't really go to class, didn't study. I just did bare minimum. When I applied to dental school eventually, I thought I was going to be screwed and I have no chance, but a little Canadian secret, um, when you convert letter grades, when you convert a grade from a Canadian school, they do convert it um, upward. So when you were, when you received an 80 percentile or 80% in your grade, that did get converted to a 4.0. Uh, I don't know if that's fair or not, but I being, it was very difficult um, to do well in these classes in school. Uh, compared to uh, doing well in, a, in an American exam. So after I completed my bachelor's, I naturally progressed into a research-based master's, which seems a little bit different than what I hear about master's programs in the United States. 
the United States that you don't really take classes. You're basically working a nine to five job in a lab. So I became very proficient in taking care of cells, number crunching and running experiments day to day, which was pretty mundane. It was a very quiet kind of lifestyle, something I didn't exactly enjoy because it was very boring. Um, you can spend a lifetime doing research and not have very many findings. I recently looked for my, my thesis that is on the Western website. Um, so when you're doing a project like this, you get so hyper-focused in such a small niche category. And uh, looking back at this, none of this makes sense to me because it was so long ago. Uh, but I knew I didn't want to do this forever. So that's when I decided I had to do something else. All right, so when it finally came down to applying to dental school, I had my letters of reference, which we all needed to do. Luckily, I was pretty close to the professors who referred me because they were my laboratory supervisors as well as a dentist that I shadowed. Um, I think it's gonna be pretty challenging to stand out to get a professor to send you a unique letter of reference, especially remembering back a lot of my class sizes were so large that you really have to make yourself known to have a more uh, personalized reference. We'll talk a little bit more later on about my, my own personal statement, um, what kind of story I was building in my application and what I wanted to let them know. Um, so you were kind of drawing or painting a picture of what your passions are, or what makes you unique. So even though I did other things that maybe um, looked well upon like research, um, research experience or job experience, my focus was really my passion in the arts. So this was my um, CV or my resume 10 years ago, which completely looks different now, but I had to dig deep into what it looked like in 2011. Um, so while all of this is, these are all things that I did do, it really helps to just focus on a few things that you are really proud of or you worked really hard for. So the things that I really emphasized on are the observership in the dental clinic where I shadowed a dentist in my area. And the other thing being, uh, when I was a volunteer photographer for this big fashion show event at my school. Um, so we worked several months. It was a charity fashion show where I was the volunteer photographer. Um, so we did a lot of things like we did a model search. We got venues. Um, we ran ads and these were published where I took photos. And then we collaborated with different local boutiques and clothing stores. And we ended up raising that year around $24,000, which we donated to the Children's Health Foundation. Uh, I still really much enjoy doing photography, but it's hard to do everything that you like doing when you work a full-time job now. Okay, so we'll look a little bit into my personal statement that I made uh, over 10 years ago, which in no way is this like the best way to compose your statement is just going to be kind of a guideline and I'll kind of break it down to see where I felt like um, my story was being told well. So I started off in the introduction briefly talking about how, how I got to become interested in dentistry, um, talking about my academic journey, but then I decided to segue that into how I enjoyed uh, working as a photographer and how I really enjoyed the arts and how I was already a scientist. So combining those, I thought dental uh, dentistry was going to be the best fit for me. The largest component of the personal statement was from my experiences in shadowing, which is why it is going to be very important to, uh, if you can, in-person shadowing. Um, so I talked a lot about the procedures, but my advice is you don't really want to focus on the names or the dental jargon of what the procedures or the surgery was, but what you got from it. So I remember when I went into shadow for the first day, I was like bringing my notebook, taking notes of what he said, like inferior alveolar nerve block. And he looked at me and was like, why are you taking notes? You're going to learn all this later on. So you really don't need to focus on the details, but how the patient feels. Um, for example, I remember they saw like a child who was in pain because they had a mouthful of cavities from not brushing or not using fluoride. And 
the take home is, you know, how can we educate this child so that they're no longer going to be in pain or a patient who couldn't eat anymore because they had ground their teeth down so much and the dentist was helping him eat or they gave him a night guard and he was finally able to sleep. So really the bigger picture is going to be the focus. Um, yep, so I segued again into my observership and how you see yourself in that dentist position. So I did look back and I like where I mentioned time management. I didn't really know what I was talking about here, but I do know that time management is, is huge now in my day-to-day. -day. Uh, I remember Dr. Terzis, the dentist I shadowed, he said time management is so important and that his, his practice, he owns his own practice, was really stressful for him because it was like managing his own hospital. That's what he said. Uh, I didn't believe him at the time because I heard that dentists have like such easy lifestyles. They don't have to take call. Uh, but now I know what he meant. It's, it's hard to manage um, juggling patients, managing a team all at the same time. Uh, and finally, in my outro in the, in, in the conclusion, uh, it feels a little bit cringy reading this now, but dental schools really do like to teach the students about community outreach. A lot of schools actually require you to do an externship in a smaller community. Um, and this is true. I do like doing outreach. I have done in the past. I tried to do it last year, but a lot of the mission trips were canceled last year and this year due to COVID. But when they do open up again, I do think it is, an, it is important to see what other communities are like. Okay, we'll briefly uh, go over interviewing, but my my word of advice is I wish I hadn't over overthought too much about my interviews because I was so over rehearsed and over practiced for my, my first interview. Uh, once I got in and then my second and third ones came, I was a lot more relaxed and it just was more natural and comfortable for me when I wasn't too over rehearsed. So these are just some take home points. Even if you do rehearse as best as you can, there are going to be some curveball questions. Um, I remember a few of these that I were I was asked at my interviews that I didn't have a answer prepared. Um, but if anyone wants to know the answers to what I said at the time, uh, you can ask me later. Okay, so once we got into dental school, I thought everything was set. I can figure out the rest later on. I just wanted to get in. But once I got in, uh, I realized how expensive it was going to be. And this was back in 2012, 2013. So I know it's it's been overinflated since then, but the cost for one semester ends up being around, it was around 75 to 80,000 a year for me over the course of four years going to be well over 400,000 now for attendance at a private school. And everyone was telling me, oh, you'll get the loans, you'll be a dentist, and you're going to make so much money that you're going to pay it off so easily. And everything they said then was a lie, because it is not easy paying off these loans. Like, I will go over how I have budgeted and how I've been paying things off. But it's been really difficult. And it's it's like this constant like doom looming over your day to day. So I can't exactly speak for um, how it is paying back as an American. I do know you're able to get the loans through a federal grant or federal loan at a high interest rate. Um, what I have seen are payment are payment income based repayments, whether it's 10 or 15 years. Uh, and a lot of graduates do refinance for a lower rate. For me, being Canadian, I wasn't able to get a federal loan but I applied for a private bank loan, which most Canadian banks will grant it for you for a dental or medical school. The interest was good, um, but you had to pay it as soon as you took it out. The government gave you barely any loan at all. Um, so I was fortunate enough that uh, my parents did give me another $100,000 so that I was able to pay my tuition. Uh, and I can say finally that after this year, I will be done paying down these loans. I will just have the $100,000 left to pay my parents. And we'll go over that too. So this is one of the slides that they showed us the first day of orientation. 
um, first day of dental school. And I saw this schedule and I just about died because it looks like every day, 7.30 to five is when you'll be having class or clinic clinic. And that's what it ended up being. Um, so most days we'd be at school from seven to five, we'd get home, we'd study all night. And then when we have to repeat it again, early in the morning, most people would just be passed out in class. This is my roommate. And we like sneakily get pictures of everyone when they were sleeping and it, and it ended up being everyone was asleep at some point. But I do still think of my dental school experience with uh, fond memories, even though I cried a lot and we studied so much, but we also went out a lot. We did a lot of events together, outreach programs, and we still tried our best to work out every day. So this is one of my earlier days in the sim lab. I remember this terrifying mask that we had to use in our sim lab as a mannequin. Uh, and you had to take good care of this because if it had a tear or rip or stain, you could fail your competencies. Um, so we had a really big class too. And I just thought it was funny, like on project days, there'd be 150 of the same project, this model that we'd all have to submit. We were actually the first class that was expanded. Normally the class was, I think, uh, 80 to 90, but they expanded my year to 150. So when I was in dental school, I didn't think I wanted to specialize, but I knew I liked working with kids, but I didn't really want to work that hard to um, get into a specialty program. And I was also like feeling so poor. I just wanted to work straight out of school, but I still really enjoyed um, doing outreach for kids. So we did screenings at community health centers and here we are at 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning uh, making free mouth guards for kids in sports. In my final year of dental school, some of us had the privilege of traveling to a rural area in Honduras, um, providing free dental care to the community. So we were seeing both kids and adults. Um, it was very humbling because even before the crack of dawn, there would be lineups and crowds of people just waiting to be seen and they don't even know who you are and they don't care if you're competent you're just a student but they barely ever get to see a dentist so they're so grateful even though the um the materials we used sucked and it was so hot and stuffy it was so long and tiring uh, when we get home on the bus everyone's just passed out like dead tired but it was still a very great experience. And I think everyone in dental school should um, have the chance to do it. And I would definitely look into doing it again. All right, so I dug up my transcript from dental school my first year. These are all the classes that we had to take. I tried so hard to get straight A's my first um, semester that I just got burnt out. I was, I was just so tired. There's just no way we could upkeep this for four years. Um, so even everyone else was, you know, working their ass off their first semester, but we all got tired halfway through that by the end of fourth year, when we're in clinics, I just, I just did not care anymore. I just wanted to pass C's get degrees, like they say, um, and in clinic, a lot of these grades from what I can remember is pretty arbitrary. Um, you get your grade from competencies, depending on whether or not your uh, clinic instructor was having a good day or not. So I think that grades from clinic don't really determine, they're so minimal your requirements that they're not gonna determine whether or not you're gonna be a good dentist. I think most of your clinical skills are going to come just from real world practice, which is why having a mentor is pretty important when you're first out of school and someone you can learn from, um, or else you'll be doing a lot of trial and error, which is okay too, you can learn that way. You just might make more mistakes along the way. All right, so after I graduated, I moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin to start my practice. Um, it was a multi, multi provider practice. So several general doctors and we had a mentor. I was so keen on doing every and all procedures and I wanted so badly to be good at all of them. So I came in on weekends. I practiced um, doing root canals on extracted teeth. I was like, doing all of my root canals. I even did a CE to place implants. I was so happy I placed my first implant. 
Um, after a couple of years in Milwaukee, I ended up moving to Denver, Colorado, where I also did general practice. Um, but eventually, I started not liking these procedures. Actually, root canals and surgeries are my least favorite now. I think my just my personality just changed. Um, I do feel a lot of I do feel too overwhelmed when doing big procedures like this. So, I do um, I do find that pedo pediatric dentistry is a lot more enjoyable for me where I can be more patient focused and work primarily just with simple procedures. So after I moved to Colorado for one year, um, my original practice in Milwaukee reached out and they needed someone to cover pediatrics. Even though I was a general provider, I did really want to work with kids. So I was very happy to come back to the same practice where I see all of their children patients 12 and under. Uh, and it's a pretty big practice. This is just some of the providers. We have four general and one of each specialty and hygienist as well. So in my practice, I see all the kids. Um, we do exams, cleanings, fillings, um, pulpotomy, stainless steel crown, baby teeth extractions, and impressions for space maintainers, and that's it. Uh, most of it is just behavioral management because they're kids, they'll cry. We use nitrous oxide as our sedative. Um, any patient who's a lot younger and needs any kind of deeper sedation, I don't do those. I do refer those out. Um, the only reason I would go back to school to do a pediatric specialty is to do sedation, but I haven't thought too much about whether or not I want to do that yet. Uh, in my clinic, I have four chairs that I use for cleanings, and then we have one main operatory where we do um, our, our major work and for um, nitrous as well. And it's just fun for me to see a lot of kids because they always get excited and we like to decorate when it's seasonal. All right, so this is what my desk looks like. My schedule is uh, full-time hours. I work 37 hours. Uh, Wednesdays are my off days. My schedule varies depending on the time of year. It's usually busier when the kids are off school, such as summer, Easter holidays. So typically when it's busy, we'll run three columns and we'll see up to 30 patients. In a regular, more chill day, we'll see maybe 15 to 20. And our first column is all our operatories. Second are our cleanings. Thirds, we do new patients, um, emergencies, and impressions. Uh, so this is my desk, and I like to keep all the, um, the pictures that they draw for me. Okay, so we will talk then about um, earning an income in dentistry and paying back loans. So when I first started right out of school in Milwaukee, I was making $140,000. And when I came back, I negotiated my contract to $210,000 per year. So, I mean, everything is negotiable, but your salary doesn't necessarily determine how much money you'll be making. So it's, it's very arbitrary. Your income is mostly determined by how productive you are, how many procedures you do. So while you do get the salary, you're also going to be making a bonus, which is how much you produced above your salary, if that makes sense. So I took this screenshot of my um, pay st statements. I do work for a corporate office, so I'm able to access all of this and we'll kind of break it down. So the pay statements are biweekly. We get paid every two weeks, um, keeping in mind that taxes, a lot of it, a lot of it just you'll never see because it goes to tax. Um, a lot you have to pay in um, medical insurance, malpractice and disability. Those are things you just have to do as a provider. My word of advice is um, contribute as much as you can to retirement. Just max it out, especially if you work for a company that matches because that's just free money. So take advantage of that as well as your health savings account. Um, and then what you take home, we'll talk a little bit about how we budget that. So after what I collect in my take home paycheck, Half of it, I won't even see because it just automatically gets deposited into a separate account that I'm gonna to use to pay off my loans. 
Um, I drive a very cheap car. I bought it for $7,000 and it's a hybrid, so I don't pay for gas. Um, so I already paid that off and it's, it's a very minimal payment towards car. My rent is relatively cheap where I live now. So housing probably around $1,000 to $1,500 is standard. And things we can't live without, such as gyms, Netflix, Spotify, food, all of that. After paying all my bills, whatever's left over, uh, just go straight to loans too. So anything I, I can spend on, I will, but then whatever's left over goes straight to loans. So I don't even have a savings account. I've never had one because I never have savings to put in. All right, so some things to consider when you're working as a dentist, um, things that I've kind of learned along the way. Um, not everyone is going to like you, which is big because I feel like I am a really big people pleaser. I always try to do what's right, but not everyone's gonna like that and that's okay. Uh, a lot of things are gonna be really predictable day to day, even though you've done this procedure a million times, you never know what's gonna happen, how the patient's gonna react. Um, a big one for me is your work may or will fail. You try your best to save a tooth because the patient really wants you to save the tooth, but you shouldn't have saved it because it's probably going to break or they won't take care of it. It's really hard to accept that, especially if the patient, you know, blames you, even though you told them it's not going to work out. Um, so yeah, back, back pain is huge too. A lot of my colleagues have some kind of uh, back or neck pain. Um, so I'm now seeing a chiropractor because my neck has been hurting. At one point, I'm, I was seeing a chiropractor, a physical therapist, um, a personal trainer, and a regular therapist, all because of work-related stress. Time management, as I mentioned before, also managing a team of your assistants, your hygienist. Um, if anyone has ever said they haven't wanted to snap at their team member is lying, but you shouldn't do it because they do not get paid enough. To, um, to deal with your complaints. And also managing patient expectations. You Sometimes you just can't deliver a perfect result and that's okay, but sometimes the patient will expect you to. So I'm a part of a few groups on Facebook um, of other dentists who express their complaints and it's comforting to know that everybody feels pretty much the same. Not everybody loves dentistry. Uh, a lot of them do feel the same stresses as I do. But some of the good sides is um, besides the obvious of work-life balance, getting paid, um, something that I enjoy is feeling accomplished with my work, especially if you have like a very apprehensive child who you build trust with and eventually they, you know, end up being a good patient because they like being with you. Oh, this is one of the clips because I was in the local news when they interviewed me uh, as a a dentist providing dentistry or providing services to kids during the pandemic. So the question for me then is, do I regret pursuing dentistry? Most days, very, very much so. Other days, I, I feel like I have a pretty good day. Uh, if I could have gone back in time, I can't say for sure if I would have still gone into dentistry, or if there's something else I'm more interested. Uh, I don't really know what the day to day would be like if I pursued something else. Um, but I do know that um, being a dentist allows me to have a lifestyle where I can pursue other interests um, and also provides the financial means to be able to do so. So some words of advice if you do go into dentistry is your life doesn't have to be about work. You should have other interests and you should be able to talk, talk to other people. Um, I'm lucky that a lot of my colleagues I'm very close to, my coworkers at my clinic. My boyfriend is also a dentist, which is a good thing and a bad thing because one, we understand each other and we understand our complaints, but when we've had a, we both had a long day, all we can talk about is dentistry. And sometimes it's, it's good to just not. Uh, I do encourage volunteering or having non-dental related interests. And of course, taking care of yourself, getting enough sleep, um, exercising, meditating for me really helps with my anxiety and getting ready for the day. Um, so outside of work, I always have to make sure I work out or at least try to work out every single day. I like to run outside uh, when the weather is nice. Otherwise, I, 
I do a lot of group fitness, but because of COVID, um, it's either shut down or we have to wear a mask, which sucks. But me and my periodontist, we do enjoy going to Orange Theory. And my my biggest and best purchase this year is this Peloton bike, which I really love because the classes are challenging and it's really convenient to be able to work out at home. Uh, if I didn't work out, I just honestly, I wouldn't have the energy to go through a long day of screaming kids. So it has really done a lot for me, um, not just um, getting your heart rate up and giving you energy, but weight training is really important too. Um, so I do have to work out my back, my arms to give that stability. Luckily, I don't have back pain like a lot of other people do, uh, just neck pain. <laughs> and I'm working on that. Of course, I like to travel in pre-pandemic times. I even took three months off between jobs to travel to as many countries as I can. Um, nowadays, it's mostly traveling locally, but hopefully someday when borders open up again, uh, it, it really is important to me to see how other countries live. I also really enjoy um, drawing as much as I can. So these are some of my artworks that I did recently. I like to paint portraits and I also um, draw people's pets on a volunteer basis. So I donate the full commission price to the Wisconsin Humane Society where I'm also a volunteer. So I offer my home to foster cats and dogs when they don't have space for them in the shelter. And I also um, help them find homes and I go into the shelter to both feed and give them their meds and play with them because I just love animals so much. I have a dog too, but he doesn't live with me because I work such long hours. So he's at home with my family. And that's it. <laughs> That was pretty quick, but thanks so much for listening and any questions that you may have, feel free to ask them and I'll try my best to answer them. Um, thank you so much. I was actually very informational and very thorough. Thank you for being so open about um, all your stat statistics and everything. Um, we had a question about your uh, resume. If you want to go back to that slide. Oh, my resume. Um, okay. There was one thing about, uh, I think, is it Shinba High School in China? Yes. Can you tell us yeah. more about that? <laughs> uh, that was so long ago. Okay, when I traveled back to China that year, um, my uncle was a superintendent there. So I just traveled to the, the high school there and I just conversed with um, the students there because they're always very eager to learn English. I think that's a really big deal for them. So I just visited the schools, the local school from my hometown in China and just like conversed in English with them. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, also, did you do any research in dental school? Oh, uh, yes, I did. <laughs> I did do a project um, in dental school. It's different because it's not like in a laboratory, most of the research in dental school is clinical, clinical based. So one of the projects I did was looking for any correlation between diabetes and um, like fainting. So what we would do is we would go around to the patients and we would um, take a blood sample, see what their blood glucose level was, and then compare that with their health history. And a, a second project we did was to determine if there was any correlation to um, their treatment, like surgical treatment and what's called osteonecrosis, which is a term that in some patients that take like like this medication for osteoporosis, they can, like their jaw can break down from surgery. So we were just looking if this person was taking this med, did they end up having that jaw problem? So a lot of it is just looking through patient charts, um, putting numbers in and um, looking at statistics. So if you do do research in dental school, it's not going to be like cells. It's mostly going to be looking at patient records. Do you think your research background from like undergrad and your master's help you with your classes though in dental school? My master's? No, because I, I didn't really take uh, any classes in, in my master's program. And a lot of the like research that you do is, is very, very niche. Like it's very focused on one, one molecule in stem cells that it doesn't really teach you about 
biochemistry in dental school. So I think my like undergraduates did did help me for like dental school classes a lot, but my master's, I really don't think it gave me any advantage. <laughs> um, okay, uh, you also had a slide um, with questions that caught you off guard during your interview that you said you were gonna oh, yeah. elaborate on at the end. So would which you go one? <laughs> um, it was, it literally says questions that caught me off guard. Okay, and, so. Like, yeah, the first question, um, very random question. It was an essay question. So at USC, when they were doing interviews, it was very different. They all had us in a room and you had to write essay quest or essays for the questions. And the question was describe the last movie you saw. And the last movie I saw that year was Rango, which I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it's like this cartoon lizard. And I was honest, like I said, that's the movie I saw <laughs> and it had nothing to do with dentistry. And I know a lot of people would like pre-plan like, oh, the last the last movie I saw was, I don't know, something like profound and Oscar worthy. But no, I just said, I straight up said I watched Rango. Um, what would you do if you saw your classmates cheating? Um, that one was a little tough for me because I know a lot of people do cheat in dental school and I... I personally would never rat someone out. I know that's what they wanted me to say, but that's not what I said. So I didn't say that. I just said, um, if I observed it, I just wouldn't partake in it, but I would never like bring that up to a staff member. And why do you want to go to that school? When they asked me that at UDM, I was just honest, like that school was the closest to my hometown and I just wanted to go home on the weekends. Uh, I think she really liked that answer. And it does really show that you want to go to that school. Having like your family as your support system is important to a lot of people. Um, so I think if they ask you, you should really show your interest in that school. Did they ask you about your grades at all? Um, no. So when I applied and you have bad grades, yeah, you shouldn't focus on that. I didn't even mention in my application or personal statement, like, this is why my grades are bad. I don't think it's necessary. They did uh, ask about, I don't know if you know, but in Canada, if you do the DAT, you have to do like this soap carving. And I failed that. They did ask me about that. But I said, like, I'll be honest, like, it was a stupid, it was really, un you can't prepare for that. So I just said like, I wasn't good at it. And then they didn't even care anyway. Um, another question we had was, um, what profession would you go into if not dentistry? Since you said sometimes you feel like you wouldn't. So which profession would you <laughs> want to be in if not? Yeah, so I thought like maybe medicine, but I mean, that's, that's not something I feel like I really would want to do. I have thought a lot about graphic design or creative writing, um, but I know that they, they don't pay very well. So like I said, at least being in dentistry, you make a decent income to be able to do these things on the side. Um, why did you not apply to a um, Canadian dental Canadian schools. School. I, sh I did, I should have mentioned that. It was just way too competitive because um, they have a cutoff. They don't even consider you if you don't even make the cutoff. And for most schools, it was like 88%. And I definitely didn't make that. So even if I applied, you wouldn't have a chance because you wouldn't even get through. Do you know anything how it is to apply from um, like outside of to a Canadian school? So like, let's say an American student would want to apply to a Canadian school. Oh, a Canadian Canadian school. Um, it would be good because the tuition is a lot cheaper in Canada, but I do know that it's going to be really hard. It's kind of like if you were in one state and you wanted to apply out of state, they only have a very small number of seats for those applicants. So I'd say it's not impossible, but it's going to be very, very difficult, especially because provinces in Canada have that same statistic that they only have two seats for out of out of state or out of province applicants. And the, it usually goes to like another Canadian rather than like a foreign national. All right. Um, do you plan on opening your own practice at all? 
I thought I wanted to, but I get overwhelmed so easily. And I already get so stressed <laughs> with my schedule that having to deal with billing and insurance and like payroll and all of that on top of everything else, well, I feel it would be way too much for me. So no, <laughs> not for me. Yeah. Um, so do you have any like memorable patients or like key points on how to deal with kids? Because usually, well, I um, work at a dentist's office part time. Usually when we get kids, they're usually very scared and always um, crying. And mm -hmm. yeah, do you have any tips? So with the anxious kids, you'll be able to know right away if they're anxious, they'll be very timid. So you just have to spend some time getting them to chill out. You can't just jump into a, like getting them numb. Um, you have to start slow. Um, so a lot of them respond very well to nitrous, which is laughing gas. And we play a movie that they like so that they have something to watch. We'll, um, we can have mom and dad in the room too. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, if all else fails and you try to you know, show them and get them comfortable and they just won't have it, that's when you do have to consider sedation options. I mean, if they're under two, chances are they're not going to be cooperative. So you do have to consider sedating them in a hospital. But you'd be surprised. A lot of three-year-olds I've done extensive work on and they have no problem being still. Were you always good with kids or do you think you're like better now versus when you first started out? I think anyone can be good with kids. It's just not a lot of people have that patience for kids. I know most, most providers won't even see a kid because they already expect them to be reactive, but I, I don't mind. I don't mind that. And I think if you like just spend time with them, it'll, it'll just be fine. Okay. Um, do you have any um, tips for approaching a dentist and forming strong personal connections with your superiors? You mean foreshadowing? Um, yes, and I guess it also applies for uh, professors too. Oh, how do I? How do you approach them to refer you? Okay, well, I mean, the dentist one is easy because you're one on one when you observe the dentist. So they'll, you'll have a lot of time to get to know them and get to know each other. So uh, that's not going to be a problem. It's, it's going to already be pretty personalized. Um, unfortunately, I don't, I don't really know how to approach a professor if you're in a big classroom. Um, but in most programs, as you go to second, third, and fourth year in your undergraduate, the classes do get smaller. So the professor does have more time for you if you do go to them after hours. And now with Zoom and whatever technology is new, it's much more easier for you to reach out to your professors, I think, than it was for us. So as long as they know who you are and you get to talking to them, then I don't think they'll have a problem referring you. Um, are you, so from, if you could go back in time, let's say you're still, um, in dental school, are you where you thought you would be? <laughs> well, I wanted to do everything. I thought I wanted to like be general and be good at all procedures. And I wanted to do like beautiful veneer clay cases, like you see on Instagram, like that was my goal. Um, so no, that's, not what I do now <laughs> and it's totally different like when I thought what dentistry would be like is different because um you know I thought because oh I'm good at art and I like sculpting that oh dentistry is going to be easy which is, is yes and no um some of it does play a part like when you're shade matching but uh a lot of what I do now is and just like getting the teeth healthy rather than having them look beautiful. Okay, um, as a woman and um, a minority, have you ever had like any struggles in the dentistry world to um, uh, be taken seriously? As a woman, no. I think a lot of parents prefer, some of them prefer like a female pediatric dentist. That's what I have heard. Um, being a minority, not, not that anyone said outrightly, but I am a minority, minority where I am. So sometimes I, maybe it's in my head. I feel like maybe that could be a problem, but 
not that I've ever experienced where I mostly get some pullback is you don't look old enough to be a dentist and a lot of new grads do get that but I mean it is I look how I look like as long as you can show them that you're capable it doesn't really matter how young you look and I'm not even young I'm 34. (laughs) I think that's still pretty young. (laughs) No. (laughs) Um, Let's see. Um, how, how did you, I know you mentioned you took care of your mental health by, um, you know, sticking to fitness and everything, but how did you, how did you, um, deal with, um, you know, at some point you stopped like caring about your grades, but what if somebody is like really, um, in a rut, how do you recommend them to get out of it? You mean an academic rut? Yeah, like burnout. You mentioned that oh, uh, for a while you burn out trying so hard. Yeah. How do you make Well, the, the good that? thing is it's not you alone. When you have a class, like a large class size, everyone is going through the exact same thing. So what helps with me is I, I never studied alone or I rarely studied alone. We'd have like study groups or we go study at a cafe with um, another person. We work out together and then we would study together. So I think having like other people in the exact same position as you definitely helps because it's hard to be motivated when you're alone. Okay, um, I think that's all the questions we have so far thank you so much for your elaborate um presentation it was so informational and thank you for being so upfront about um how much it costs and how what it takes to pay it off as well Mm -hmm. yeah if anyone has any questions about finances they can reach out to me okay all right um do you have your social media listed on your um Um, just type it here I don't really post a lot, <laughs> but my Instagram handle is Tooth Explore. I recommend checking it out. She has really pretty uh, travel pictures on there. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I haven't think- traveled much, but I'm I check it. So any anytime I get messages, I'll be able to receive them. Okay. All right. I think that's it. Thank you. So-